What reaction does object 237 exhibit to injection 14? 08, asked the man in his 50s, with a sturdy build, wearing a white lab coat, his tone weary. It was evident that he had grown disillusioned with the project, yet his innate stubbornness kept him going. The scientist looked at his assistant through his bright blue eyes, peering from beneath his glasses. No reaction. The young man around 20, 25 years old, stuttered, beads of sweat rolling down his forehead. He glanced at the man and flinched, clearly not expecting that manic grin. None at all? The scientist asked, with hints of anger. Object 237 is male. Dr. Reitman, you yourself established that injection. 14. 08 has no effect on them. All previous male subjects perished when injected with only a quarter ounce of the solution from 14. 01 to 14. 07. You yourself determined that the male gender does not react to subsequent injections, the assistant replied, as if reciting from a memorized script. Yes, I forgot, completely forgot. The scientist absent-mindedly tousled the assistant's hair, causing his chestnut locks to stand on end. The man yawned, stretching sweetly. Perhaps you should rest and sleep, the young man suggested. But the scientist shook his head. No, we need to examine object 237, and then you can go rest. Dr. Reitman stood at the door, about to enter the room, when he turned back to look at the young scientist sitting at the computer. Open the door, he commanded, and the assistant, pressing a couple of buttons, replied, done. The scientist was about to enter the room, but strange devices began to beep and flash. The young man looked around in fear and asked, What's happening? Steve, go examine the object while I figure out what's happening here, the doctor nervously replied. Steve nodded and left. The man approached the microphone and pressing a button spoke loudly and clearly. Station number five, respond. What's happening? This is laboratory number six. Station number five, respond. The microphone squealed, hissed, and then a raspy voice replied, Here. Injection 14. Zero. Object 200. 50. Experiment. Oh, God. The voice trailed off, but amidst the hissing, screams and moans could be heard. Finally, a wild howl and growling echoed through the microphone before the connection was lost. The man, leaning on the table with his hands, stood motionless. He was pale, fear gleaming in his eyes, and a manic smile spread across his face. Beyond the heavy metal door, screams resounded. The scientist grinned even wider and sat down at the computer to send the experiment results. The sound of keys clicking blended with the cries for help behind the door. The doctor leaned back in his chair, ran his hand through his dark hair, and sighed. Does this mean the experiment was successful? We'll find out soon. He answered his own question, and hearing the sound of the door being torn from its hinges turned around, arms wide open. A huge wolf lunged at him, three times larger than usual, and began tearing into his flesh with savage fury. The scientist laughed maniacally until blood sprayed from his mouth. The animal stepped back from the corpse and headed away. Around was a huge puddle of blood, and the body now resembled mush. Ribs were broken, some entrails devoured, legs crushed, arms broken in several places, exposing bloody bones from the wounds. Only the head of the scientist remained untouched. The animal had bitten through the neck, but the smiling face remained intact. Amidst this mess, only a tag with the number 237, clenched in a fist, stood out. The dead silence was shattered by the sound of the microphone. Laboratory number six, we received your data. Respond. This is the central base. Respond. The lamps, dimly illuminating the room, swayed, 
casting menacing patterns on the walls, resembling monsters, while the microphone continued to crackle. Laboratory, six, respond, laboratory. I woke up standing at the exit of the underground laboratory. Generally, I often blacked out like this, losing consciousness since I ended up here for experiments. Surely I have some kind of split personality. Whatever, the main thing now is to escape. It doesn't matter how I managed to break free, what happened, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I almost succeeded. I started running without choosing a path, running away from these tortures. I can't take them anymore, so I can't go back. No way. My breath was uneven. A sharp pain grew somewhere in my side. Damn. I slowed down and switched to a walk. Inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. Again, inhale, then exhale. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. That's how my trainer taught me. Before they took me and put me in a cage. Before that. Before the horror. How long ago was it? My breathing steadied. I started running again. Continuing the inhales and exhales. That's how the trainer taught me. What was his name? I don't remember. How old was I then and how old am I now? I don't remember. What's my name? I don't remember either. I've gotten used to being called subject. Now I'm free and I won't go back. Suddenly I fell, tripping over a stone right onto the damp ground. Immediately I stood up, looked around. No one. And I started running again. Can't stop. They'll find me. Run, run, run. Tree branches cut my arms and legs. I looked at them and only then noticed that they were elbow deep in dried blood. I slowed down, stopping. Well, I killed someone, most likely guards. A fair price for freedom. I agree with it. Just need to wash off the blood. I started running again. Inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. My muscles don't hurt at all. I'm used to the loads. Steve, I remember his name, recorded data. I ran, lifted weights, dodged projectiles every day. The air became cooler. There must be a body of water nearby. I descended the slope, looked around. I was lucky. No one was there. And a stream rushed through the stones. I started washing my hands. I wanted to drink, but first I had to clean the blood off my hands. The water was icy, but I'm used to sharp temperature changes. In the laboratory, these were ordinary daily checks on the subjects. How long was I there? A week? A month? A year? Ten years? I don't remember. My reverie was interrupted by the crack of a branch. How did I not notice the approach? I turned around instantly. It is a she-wolf, very large, with a strong body and paws, knife-sharp claws, and black fur. I know her past. It was just one time. I was sitting in a cage and she too. A girl. With black hair. That damn Steve injected her with a big needle with some liquid recorded data and left. The girl was in hysterics. She had a fever. Painful blisters appeared on her smooth skin and then coarse fur. Nails blackened and grew. She probably would have turned into a wolf, but her heart couldn't take it. I don't know her name, where she was from. I only remember how she looked at me in despair, begging for help. She had blue eyes. Then her pupil dilated, her eyes turned beastly. I was very scared then. I tried to run, but I couldn't do anything. And the she-wolf stood before me, bearing sharp fangs. I was afraid to move. A gust of wind tousled my dark brown hair. I flinched. The monster, apparently sensing a familiar scent, calmed down. The pupil in its eyes shrank. The gaze briefly turned human. Do you know me? The beast howled. Long and mournful, and then it went away. I breathed a sigh of relief, sat back down on my haunches, and began greedily gulping water from the stream. Only now did I notice that I was naked. 
the pale skin was covered in dirt from the fall. Or have I also become a monster? Frantically feeling my skin, I exhaled in relief when I realized there was no coarse fur. I exhaled with relief and began to wash myself. As I washed my neck, I cautiously stopped. Someone was coming. Hey, who's there? A female voice came from the hill. I couldn't say anything, just growled in distress. Have they already found me? A beautiful and tall woman descended from the slope and approached me. I recoiled, crawling across the stream. Hey, wait, don't think of me as a pervert. I'm not like that. But you seem to have gotten into trouble, she said. Come with me. It's not far from here. You're not in danger. The woman turned and started walking slowly. I barely understood her. After all, the lack of communication had taken its toll. I had spent a very long time in a cage. The woman cautiously, fearing to startle me, adjusted her greenish hat, shielding her eyes from the rare beams of light. Who is she? What does she want? And what should I do? I looked at her with bewilderment, expecting danger. What happened to you? Why are you in such a state? She continued talking, and I slowly backed away further. Hey, wait, don't think of me as a pervert. I'm not like that, but you seem to have gotten into trouble, she said. Come with me. It's not far from here. You're not in danger. The woman turned and started walking slowly. Cautiously, still wary, I obeyed and followed her. We climbed up the slope and walked past the trees for some time. I still feared she might betray me and return me to the laboratory. But still I kept walking, ready to run and hide at any moment. Finally, the woman stopped in a small clearing. There was a pile of black branches in the center surrounded by stones, a campfire. To the left of it hung a fabric, resembling either a cone or a rounded dome. A tent. The woman went inside and pulled out a stack of clothes with a towel. Emboldened, I took the towel and began to dry myself. How are you? Are you okay? She asked with concern. I opened my mouth to answer, but I was interrupted by a shrill cry of a person followed by a wolf's howl. The woman was frightened. I saw her hands trembling. Darkness clouded my vision. An unimaginably strong heat found me. Pain shot through my body like an electric shock. I felt like I was about to explode. Similar sensations occurred when I was last injected with some liquid. Fire spread through my body. Blood rushed to my face and pounded in my temples. I started to suffocate. My ears were filled with some noise. It sounded like the screams of a person and a wolf. Only they merged, forming an indescribable roar that tore through my eardrums. I felt my heart beat faster and faster, and even faster. Suddenly everything quieted down and it seemed like I was asleep. But I didn't see any dreams. The man was kindling the fire. He was already quite tired. The road was long, they walked on foot, then set up the tent and now this damn fire just wouldn't catch. Hey, Kevin, are you done yet? A voice came from the tent. I'm tired of waiting and starving. The branches are wet and just won't catch fire, the man grumbled. If you're in such a hurry, try it yourself. What? Leave the branches alone. I'll do it myself. A voice replied. A woman in her thirties emerged from the tent. Her honey-colored hair clumsily protruded from under the greenish hat, its brim almost hiding her face, but her gray eyes stood out vividly against the hat's dark background. Her face was pleasant. Soft features, thin eyebrows, full lips, and large eyes with long lashes. She was dressed in a shirt made of sturdy material with long sleeves for protection from the sun, insects, and scratches from plants in worn but sturdy pants and swamp-colored boots. Go get some water instead, Kevin said. 
The woman gave him a displeased look and was about to go when suddenly a wolf howl was heard. She froze in fear. She knew that predators usually stayed deep in the forest and didn't come this close, as this area was often frequented by people and was set up for tourism and outdoor recreation. Animals avoided this place. So where did the wolf come from? Could it be that a predator wandered in? The man exclaimed in surprise. Kevin stood up and looked in the direction of the wolf's howl. A strong and very muscular man, he was dressed in hiking clothes and comfortable hunting boots. Kevin had the same facial features as the woman, but rougher. He had full lips and large gray eyes. He was her older brother. Maybe, the woman mumbled. What? Scared? Oh, come on. There are no wolves here. It's probably just Peter messing around again, the man said with a silly grin on his lips. No, it's not me, a guy who appeared out of nowhere replied also smiling. He had the same facial features, eyebrows, eyes, and lips. The younger brother resembled Kevin. The black wrestling shirt revealed all his muscles. The worn, dark jeans and sneakers told of his love for sports and his light honey-colored hair complemented his bronze tan. Then who else could it be? Kevin chuckled again. It seemed like he laughed at anything. Okay, I'm going. Don't fool around here and Peter. Help this idiot light the fire. Everything will be done, Captain. Uh, I mean Commander Lily, Peter said with a smile. Just do it quickly. I'm hungry as a wolf. Kevin howled softly and laughed. Idiots, the woman muttered and went to get water. Lily walked for about five minutes and watched the forest. She loved nature and knew this area very well. Tall, slender tree trunks, lush, bright green crowns, cleanliness and neatness. It looked like one of those professional nature photographs. For almost three years now, People have been coming here for tourism and outdoor recreation. The wild nature attracted a lot of people at any time of the year. But this year, as Lily had heard, about 45 people came. And it was all because tourists littered heavily. The local authorities got tired of allocating funds for cleaning up the area, and they simply reduced the number of visitors. Lily heard the splash of water, as if someone were bathing. For a moment, she thought it might be the wolf whose howl they heard, but she quickly dismissed the thought, deciding that one of the tourists was just fooling around nearby. Hey, who's there? She shouted, approaching the slope from the hill. In response, someone growled, but from the tone of the voice, Lily understood that it wasn't an animal's growl. It turned out to be a man in his thirties with short, dark blonde hair. His brown eyes reflected his fear. Lily blushed slightly at the sight of the stranger's nudity, but quickly realized that he needed help and descended from the hill. The man with animalistic habits recoiled and crawled over the stream. Hey, calm down. I won't hurt you, the woman said with care. She was very embarrassed by the stranger's nudity, so she tried not to look at his body. The man stared at Lily in surprise. He had sharp facial features, a sharp nose, thin lips, and long, fluffy eyelashes. The stranger vaguely resembled a wild, muscular wolf. Lily smirked at her thoughts, adjusting her hat to shield her eyes from the beam of light falling on them. Come with me, Lily whispered timidly. The man barely understood her. It seemed he was a foreigner who had gotten into trouble, the woman thought. The stranger cautiously complied, ready to run away at any moment. Perhaps some thugs attacked him and stole all his belongings, Lily continued to think. He's really scared. What happened to him? The woman led the poor man along the familiar path. He was still afraid of her, but he was becoming bolder with each passing moment. Finally, they reached the clearing. Lily found suitable clothes in the tent. Kevin's clothes would fit him perfectly, she decided. With this thought, Lily took a small stack and a towel, then walked out of the tent. 
The man had become quite brave by now and calmly took the towel from her hands, starting to dry his slightly damp body. Are you okay? she asked, concerned. The stranger opened his mouth to reply, but he was interrupted by a human scream, followed by a wolf's howl. The man flinched slightly, not because of the human scream, but because of the howl. Lily was also frightened and was about to go to the tent for a rifle when the stranger suddenly began to behave strangely. His pupils dilated and became like those of a wild animal. His body instantly became covered with blisters and then fur. Lily took a step back in fear, stumbled, and fell. At that moment, the man transformed into a werewolf before her eyes, as if in a horror movie. The huge wolf snarled, but upon sensing Lily's scent, it immediately calmed down. It began to walk slowly towards her. The woman was petrified with fear. She couldn't even breathe. Her heart was beating wildly a little more and she would lose consciousness. The beast approached her but did not attack. It gently, even tenderly, touched her forehead with its cold, moist nose. Lily sat. Lily took a step back in fear, stumbled, and fell. At that moment, the man transformed into a werewolf before her eyes, as if in a horror movie. The huge wolf snarled, but upon sensing Lily's scent, it immediately calmed down. It began to walk slowly towards her. The woman was petrified with fear. She couldn't even breathe. Her heart was beating wildly a little more and she would lose consciousness. The beast approached her but did not attack. It gently, even tenderly, touched her forehead with its cold, moist nose. Lily sat in bewilderment and fear, afraid to even sigh. The wolf stared into her eyes intently, then turned around and dashed off towards the cries and howling. Shocked, Lily lay down on the ground, her head spinning violently from the experience. Her consciousness slowly faded from the horror she had just experienced. Peter turned and approached the campfire. The older brother handed him matches and grinning said, follow Lily's orders. I think you can handle it yourself. I'll go find more firewood, Peter replied. Lily brought enough, the man chuckled nodding towards the pile of wood. Peter didn't know how to get out of it, but then, to his relief, a little bell rang. Did you set a trap? Kevin was outraged. In response, the guy grinned and nodded. He was clearly pleased with himself. The man clicked his tongue and headed towards the thin thread that was still tugging at the bell. Kevin hadn't gone fifty yards before he noticed a huge she-wolf. The predator was tangled in the rope with its paw and was trying to free itself, growling menacingly. Peter! The man screamed in panic. He had never seen such a huge predator in this part of the forest. Peter! Come here quickly! At last, his cries brought his brother, who stopped in amazement. He had never seen such predators, unusually large with shiny black fur and bright blue eyes. Normal individuals should have yellow eyes, but this specimen was clearly beyond the ordinary. The beast finally freed itself. Peter, in fear, took a step back, which he immediately regretted as a branch cracked underfoot. The predator looked at them and, growling, began to approach slowly. Its fur bristled, its tail rose, its fangs bared. Kevin knew that an attack was imminent, which meant they needed to save themselves. But running was not an option, and standing still was even worse. The brothers slowly backed away, but the she-wolf kept getting closer. Soon, she couldn't take it anymore and jumped on her prey. The man's reaction was quicker, and he quickly pushed his younger brother aside. The predator fiercely sank its teeth into the victim's throat. Peter quickly regained his senses, and grabbing a thick stick, swung it with force and yelled, hitting the animal on the back. The beast howled and lunged at the attacker. The guy defended himself very skillfully, but the she-wolf wasn't hurt either. Suddenly, Peter felt a sharp pain. He didn't even understand what had happened. Something had pierced his back, 
and then blood spread throughout his body. He screamed, writhing, but the wolf's sharp fangs were firmly embedded in his body. Another beast, a she-wolf with black fur, approached the guy very closely and also sank her huge fangs into his flesh. The monsters ripped Peter's body to shreds in just a few seconds. The wolf cautiously approached its relative and gently touched her snout with its nose as if whispering to her, I was worried. An old, battered car pulled up to the forest. For a couple more minutes it drove along the dirt road, but then stopped near a small building at the foot of a low hill leading into the thicket of trees. The car parked in the designated parking lot, which was already full. After unpacking their bags from the trunk, the group headed towards the small, slightly leaning wooden building. Joel, where did you bring us? You promised a resort? And this is a real dump? A tall guy, 18 or 19 years old, with a bunch of light, almost yellow hair, grumbled discontentedly. He furrowed his sharp nose and thin lines of light eyebrows, making his face look childish. He couldn't be said to look like a child at all. Quite the opposite. He had a handsome, narrow face, a strong chin, a narrow forehead covered by uneven bangs, and equally narrow, hazel-green eyes. His athletic body, not overly muscular, was adorned with worn-out jeans and a light, pale-green t-shirt. I didn't promise resorts, but everything else will be there. I arranged with a friend of mine. We'll have a clearing all to ourselves, and there are a couple of interesting surprises waiting for us, the driver reluctantly replied. He, like their whole group, was slim and wiry, except for Marcus, the blonde, who engaged in sports. Just like everyone else, he was pale. It might have been hard to tell them apart, but Joel always stood out with his brightly green clothes, a cluster of freckles and ginger hair, which he disliked and hid under his favorite yellow-green baseball cap. What are you plotting here and what other surprises? The girl protested. Her voice was, as usual, too loud and high-pitched. Like Joel, she had a cluster of freckles and dark red, almost brown hair tied in two braids. The girl preferred blue clothes, jeans, blouse, light jacket, sneakers, even her backpack and hair ties. Everything was dark. Well, Joel mumbled in defense. But Marcus turned out to be more resourceful and talkative. Angie? We just want to have fun, the blonde said, smiling. However, it didn't calm the girl down. She was already on the verge of throwing a tantrum or causing some other commotion. But the athlete began to defend himself again, not letting her get a word in. Angie, wait. Calm down. Didn't you suggest having some fun? I thought there would be something more grandiose waiting for us. What a disappointment. Her high-pitched voice once again grated on the ears. What do you suggest then? The blonde responded with a slight smirk on his lips. If you want, we can take you back. Angie looked down. No, she didn't want to go home to her stepfather. She and her brother lived separately because of their parents' divorce. He stayed with their father, she with their mother. Her stepfather tormented the poor girl and she always looked for any excuse to get away. Another year of long torment, and she would be off to college. But now, in the summer, he was everywhere, watching her every move. Now she had a chance to get away from her tormentor for a long time. Lost in terrible memories, Angie didn't notice tears welling up in her eyes. Marcus got scared. He was always afraid of girls' tears because he didn't know what to do and now the girl he really liked might start crying. The blonde gently put his arms around her shoulders and affectionately said, Hey, what's wrong? I'm not kicking you out. Marcus began to whisper something affectionate to his beloved. She had long since calmed down, but the young man didn't remove his hands from her shoulders. Meanwhile, Joel became alert. It was always hard to upset his sister. 
and now she was on the verge of tears because of an unserious and playful threat. Something's not right here, crossed his mind, but he was distracted by the grumbling of their remaining friends, Emily and Ruth. The former was short and skinny. Her plump cheeks were always rosy, as if she had been out in the cold. Thin lips, narrow brown eyes, chestnut hair always tied back in a ponytail. No, in Joel's opinion, she wasn't attractive, but she was quite cute. Hordes of guys chased after her, but for some reason she always turned them down. With her pale green windbreaker and short denim shorts, she still looked cute, even in such unattractive clothes. The second Ruth had pale, porcelain-like skin, sharp and defined facial features, almond-shaped, greenish-brown eyes, and thin lips. Perfectly straight black hair peeked out from under the hood of a light brown jacket. Khaki shorts revealed her long, slender legs. Well, are you guys coming in? A guy suddenly exclaimed, seemingly appearing out of nowhere. The wide smile of his thin lips revealed a row of white teeth. Everyone turned to see Diego. He was a tall guy, the same age as his friends. His brown hair was tousled from running. A small chin, a neat nose, large hazel gray eyes. He was definitely handsome. His slender body was hidden by a snow white t-shirt and jeans. I've paid the entrance fee. We're leaving in five minutes on their bus and saying goodbye to civilization. The whole group grabbed their bags and backpacks and followed Diego. They entered the building where about 30 people were already milling about, all with sports bags and backpacks. Inside, it was unbearably stuffy and hot, while outside, the morning chill prevailed. It was too noisy, causing the friends to grimace. It seemed like not 30 people were discussing something here, but 300. Wait here. I'll tell them you've arrived. Diego grinned and approached the wooden counter. After saying something to the attendant, he returned to the group. Okay, we're leaving in ten minutes. If anyone needs to go, the bathroom's over there, Diego said, pointing to the wooden door at the end of the hall. All right, Mommy, Joel smirked. Emily and Ruth silently headed towards the bathroom, but hesitating, they stopped and asked in unison, Angie, are you coming? The girl nodded in response and, whispering something to Marcus, shuffled after her friends. The bus was large and spacious but very old. Some passengers felt seasick, some rummaged through their bags for medication, some ate sour fruits, some just endured. Like in the building, the bus was noisy. Carolyn tiredly scanned the passengers. Over there, to the right, a group of women discussing something, eating another burger. At the front of the bus, about five teenagers are playing cards. Interesting. Doesn't the rocking bother them at all? Oh, and there, at the back of the bus, a group of six pale peers settled in. Like vampires, the girl smirked. Suddenly, the bus jolted again, and Carolyn, resting her head against the window, began to look out at the forest. Tall and slender trees, numerous lush bushes, for a moment she caught sight of her reflection. Black hair with large curls, tanned skin, big black eyes, a neat nose, plump lips. Carolyn's name didn't suit her at all. Something like Brittany would have been a better fit, but her stubborn mother named her Carolyn. The girl turned away and resumed scanning the passengers. The women continued to devour burgers, washing them down with soda. The teenagers laughed at the loser, who now yelled at the whole bus. The pale group discussed something among themselves. The girl frowned slightly. It seemed she would have a hard time finding company here. Suddenly, a scream erupted from the pale group. The brunette was screaming. Her friends immediately rushed to calm her down, but she just pointed a finger at the window. There were too many people, so Carolyn couldn't see anything. 
the redhead from the pale group immediately stood up from his seat in alarm. Wolf! The pale girl finally screamed. The teenagers behind her just laughed and started discussing something again, while the women resumed their food. Oh, come on, one of the group laughed. There are no wolves here. They're far away, closer to the mountains. Everyone knows predators don't come here. But I saw one too, the guy who had been standing said. You're mistaken, the guy insisted. Sit down and stop scaring people. It seemed he directed the last phrase at the frightened girl. The guy sat down next to her and started comforting her too. A bad feeling began to gnaw at Carolyn inside. A very bad feeling. In the forest, the group of young people set up camp. Hey, what was that scene you caused on the bus? Emily was clearly displeased. What wolves? For heaven's sake! The brunette angrily dropped her heavy bag on the grass. Ruth looked down and cautiously took off her backpack. I really saw a wolf. The brunette's voice was weak and subdued. Maybe that's enough. Marcus intervened in the conversation. If she saw it, she saw it. Let's not argue. We came here to have fun, not to fight. After these words, the blonde turned and walked away. Ruth clearly didn't want to stay in the company of her once best friend, so she muttered something about water, grabbed a bottle from her bag, and headed into the depths of the forest. Marcus, help me start the fire. These twigs just won't burn, Joel grumbled unhappily. The blonde nodded in response and approached his friend. Emily took out her headphones and lay down on the blanket listening to music. Angie had been struggling with the tent for about 15 minutes now. Diego promised to help her figure it out, but he went somewhere. Warm hands gently wrapped around her waist, and from behind, a voice heating her neck sounded. Well, darling, need a hand? It was Marcus. Angie sighed tiredly and turned to him. Yeah, I can't handle it without you. The redhead smiled faintly. Behind them there was the crackle of twigs, and Diego's voice came from behind. Hey, hey, I already promised to help her, so go. Deal with the fire. The guy caught his breath a bit and approached the couple. The blonde grudgingly stepped away from the girl and went back to the pile of damp twigs. Where did Joel go? Diego asked, almost finishing setting up the tent. He went to look for dry twigs. It rained here and he decided to go looking. Marcus grumbled under his breath. Ruth left to fetch water a long time ago and hasn't come back yet. Maybe something happened to her? I'm worried. I'll check, unexpectedly replied Emily. The brunette walked along the trees, which were as identical to each other as two drops of water. The girl, it seemed, wasn't afraid of getting lost here at all. Finally, she heard the sound of water splashing and headed towards it. A small ravine, and at the bottom, a stream of crystal clear water. Ruth was nowhere to be seen. Maybe they missed each other. That would be even better. Emily really didn't want to see her friend. She just needed to clear her head, take a walk. How tired she was of Ruth. Always trying to be the center of attention. Emily put her headphones back on and turned up the music louder. So loud that not even her thoughts could be heard. The brunette climbed up the slope and began to walk among the identical trees. A sense of unease crept over Emily as she felt someone might be behind her. She turned around no one. Perhaps it was just her imagination. But no. The feeling in her chest only grew stronger. Someone was definitely behind her. Emily subtly removed one earbud, then the other, and began to listen intently. Silence. Not even the sound of water splashing could be heard. Had she wandered so far away? Ahead, she could see some tracks. She decided to follow them. 
Emily hadn't walked 10 meters when she spotted a small clearing with a tent and a campfire. There, lying near the tent, was a woman. She couldn't have fallen asleep on the ground, which meant she was unconscious. What happened here? Emily wondered. She cautiously looked around. The forest and no one else. She decided she needed to help and slowly approached. Carefully, as if afraid to startle her, Emily knelt down. She turned the woman's face up and began to gently tap her cheeks to bring her to her senses. The woman's face twisted in annoyance and her gray eyes widened in fear. Are you okay? What happened to you? Emily asked. The woman, completely ignoring the questions, muttered, Where is he? Who? The brunette replied with surprise. He... Well, the wolf. The woman looked extremely serious, sending a shiver down Emily's spine. Um... I heard there are no wolves in this part of the forest, the brunette replied, slightly flustered. How can that be? But he... He... There was a wolf there. A huge wolf, the woman continued to look around and ask. Only now did Emily realize that the stranger was wearing a park ranger uniform. Strange. What's going on here? The girl thought. I came with friends, and if you're okay, I'll go back. The girl stood up and prepared to leave. Have you seen a man and a young guy here? The stranger asked and realizing from the girl's bewildered look that she didn't understand, continued. Well, a young guy, short, skinny, blonde. There should have been a big guy with him. Emily just shook her head. Silence fell, but not for long. The sound of a bell rang out. The woman stood up, slightly swaying, and introduced herself. I'm Lily. Thank you for, uh, the help. Emily. The girl replied curtly. We need to go and check what's there. Lily nodded towards the bell. Please help me. I'm not feeling well. The ranger smiled warmly. The brunette nodded in response. At that moment, Lily decided that Emily would be better off by her side. There's a terrifying half-man, half-wolf roaming the forest, and this girl could be in danger. Now they were walking together among the trees, following the red ribbon. Emily felt a bit strange helping this woman, but something inside her screamed that she had to. Lily suddenly stopped, causing the girl to bump into her back. What's there? she asked, peering over Lily's shoulder. The brunette froze, a wave of nausea instantly rising in her throat as a fresh metallic smell hit her nose and her head spun. What in the world happened here? Emily looked at Lily. Her face was a kaleidoscope of fear, horror, pain, confusion, and disbelief. Wolves, she whispered almost inaudibly. The girl once again stared in horror at the bloody corpses, but quickly looked away. She felt sick to her stomach. Ruth approached the ravine and descended the slope. There, the coveted stream. She unscrewed the bottle cap and immediately dropped it on the ground. Reluctantly, she bent down and rinsed it off, then filled the bottle with water. The crystal clear water turned out to be icy, as if it had come from a freezer. Ruth stuffed the bottle into her bag. She had already turned around and taken a step up the slope when she stopped. The brunette saw a track, large and clearly not human. Curiosity got the better of her. She approached the indentation. It looks like a dog's, but much larger, right? A voice echoed her thoughts, and Ruth, startled, immediately looked in the direction it came from. Ahead stood a tall, fair-haired man, strong musculature, dark clothing. Sorry to startle you, the man smiled, and his face was covered with a fine network of tiny wrinkles. Ruth couldn't even think he was old, she wouldn't have given him more than 35. My name is Howard. I used to be a hunter, but now I've come on vacation with my daughter. Ruth. The girl fell silent for a couple of seconds and looking back at the track asked, Do you think it's a wolf? The brunette spoke with doubt, but emphasized her thought firmly. 
The man squatted down. Ruth followed suit. It's a wolf. Without a doubt. Look, an adult wolf's track resembles that of a very large and heavy dog. Usually a wolf's paw print is very compact. The pads of the fingers and claws are clearly imprinted. The middle fingers are significantly extended forward. In a mature male, the paw is wider, and in a she-wolf, the track is slimmer. Howard expertly traced the paw print with his hand. But this is some enormous wolf, and it's inexperienced. Its paws are large and heavy, and it spreads its fingers. As if a human was shoved into a wolf's skin, strange, Howard pondered. Aren't there any predatory animals in this part of the forest? Ruth didn't want to believe that this place was dangerous. But didn't you see a wolf there on the bus? The man smiled slightly, scrutinizing the brunette's face. So they really are here, in this forest? Ruth jumped to her feet, ready to run. They haven't attacked anyone yet, but the threat is always there. It's better to leave here and not come back. It's dangerous here. Howard spoke seriously. Ruth looked into his eyes, hoping to see a joke there. But no, they exuded confidence and it seemed fear. Ruth was scared. Sorry, but I have to go to my daughter. Good luck and take care. The man quickly disappeared. The girl also ran, not choosing her path. She wanted to hide, find a safe place, and wait it out. But Ruth stumbled over some branches, scraped her knees, and turned around. No one was visible. Silence, silence reigned all around. The brunette got up, her leg throbbing badly. It seemed like a serious injury. Ruth couldn't go any further. She needed help. The girl took out her phone from her bag and started dialing Joel's number. The phone rang. One, two, three. Suddenly, the phone reported a network failure. Goosebumps ran over her body. What in the world is happening here? Panic set in. Ruth frantically dialed numbers, but the phone continued to display. Network failure. Please try again later. Central base. Alert. Report everything to the center director, commanded the tall man in military uniform. Despite the complexity of the situation, his face betrayed no emotion, as if it were carved from stone. One soldier rose from behind the computer and dashed off. The man sat in his place and glanced at the monitor. Is anyone recording the message from Laboratory 6? The military man shouted. Yes, we're already recording, and we've also saved the data from Station 5, responded the woman in the blue uniform. What? Station 5 too? The man was surprised. Not a single muscle on his face twitched. Yes. The woman adjusted a chestnut lock of hair. They also had a positive result with injection 14. Zero 08. The man sighed. At that moment, a tall young woman in a blue uniform entered the well-lit room. The military man jumped to his feet, straightened his back, and greeted her. The woman nodded in response. Well, tell me what happened. Her voice was steely and cold. We intercepted a message from Laboratory 6 and Station 5 about a positive result with Injection 14, 08, but we can't contact them anymore. The surveillance cameras we managed to connect to indicate that subjects 237 and 254 have escaped. All other subjects are presumed dead. The brunette answered clearly and distinctly, looking directly at the director. She couldn't hide it. She was beautiful. Long light hair, always tied back, gray eyes, perfect facial features, perfect figure. She was captivating, like a doll. And is that all? The woman raised an eyebrow. I thought there would be something more serious. Send in a special team and let them clean up everything. But the subjects have already disappeared into the national park. They were seen in the tourist area. People may be in danger, and I believe there are already victims, the girl objected. The woman turned around, her gray eyes glinting ominously. 
conscience awakened. It's too late to play innocent sheep now. You all knew what we were doing here. Stop the hysteria. As banal and grim as it may sound, progress comes with sacrifices. The director's eyes hungrily pierced the girl's face. If you're against it, you can leave. But then... The woman didn't continue. She just turned around and walked away. The brunette froze. She's the devil. The soldier voiced the girl's thoughts when the door slammed shut. Outside, she's as beautiful as an angel, but inside, she's a monster. The brunette looked at him in surprise. You'd better stay away from Liana, Bonnie. She can kill with her bare hands and not even blink an eye. Mr. Wright, come here immediately. The director was beside herself with rage. No one had ever dared to be so insolent before. What's happened? The military man was already accustomed to Liana's demeanor and thus reacted calmly. That girl who dared to oppose me, what's her name? The woman asked sternly. Bonnie Millen. Get her out of my sight. The woman had calmed down completely now. Her voice even and cold. Is that all? Wright asked again. The group should already be moving out. Let them find out everything and report back to me personally. I want to know how many people have died, and where and how, and how many survivors are left, if any. Liana's face remained stone cold and impassive. Is that all? No. Send another group to evacuate the tourists. But if necessary, they are authorized to take action as they see fit. We don't need any media uproar, that's all. Wright left the office and dispatched two teams to clear the laboratory and station, and a third to assist the people who had unfortunately found themselves trapped with the werewolves. The special group had two tasks, either to help the tourists or bury them in the forest if needed. Ruth! Where are you, Ruth? Joel yelled. The girl had gone to fetch water two hours ago and still hadn't returned. Thoughts of wolves wandered through his mind, but he quickly dismissed them. It was all untrue. It had to be. Joel? The girl's voice suddenly cut through. The boy ran in the direction from which he thought he heard the voice. Joel, I've hurt my leg and can't walk, came from somewhere to the right, behind the bushes. I'm coming, the boy pushed through the scratching branches. Joel! Ruth screamed in terror. I'm here already! The boy didn't finish his sentence. He saw his pale friend sitting on the ground, leaning against a tree. And ten yards away from her, a huge wolf with black bristly fur was snarling. The boy froze, not knowing what to do. Quiet, don't move. He couldn't understand how she could move anyway, but he still tried to reassure the distressed girl. I'll come over and help you. Joel took one step, then another, a third. There were only a couple of yards left to his friend. From here, the wolf seemed even larger. The boy cautiously squatted down and embraced Ruth's shoulders. Quiet, quiet, don't be afraid. Everything will be fine. If in a normal situation his voice would have been calming, now it only made things scarier. The boy didn't take his eyes off the wolf and tried not to make any sudden movements. It seemed like even time had stopped. The silence was shattered by an unexpected human scream. Max and Ruth flinched, and the wolf, as if waiting for this scream, glanced at the potential victims once more and ran away. The boy exhaled. It was only now that he realized he had hardly been breathing all this time. The brunette burst into tears. I told you. She choked on her sobs. There are wolves here, and you didn't believe me. Ruth stuttered through her tears. Shh. It's all over now. It's past. Don't be afraid. Joel trembled, but still awkwardly tried to comfort his friend. Let's go back to the tents. We'll gather our things and leave. What the hell happened here? Emily asked fearfully wiping her lips with her sleeve. Wolves. 
they... it... killed. Lily squeezed out each word, tears streaming from her eyes. I'm leaving. Screw this whole vacation. Screw these wolves. Screw this forest. The brunette panicked. Ruth and Joel were right. All this time here in the woods there were wolves. Hungry wolves. The woman fell silent. Just half an hour ago everything was fine. And now she saw the gnawed corpses of her brothers. We need to call the police. Lily muttered absent-mindedly. Hey, listen, let's go. Gather your things and run from here. Emily couldn't calm down. Every second felt like an eternity to her. She felt like the wolves were nearby, about to attack. We won't make it out. We're all going to die here, Ruth lamented, walking along the path and leaning on Joel's shoulder. Hey, calm down. We'll get out of here. Everything will be fine, the boy reassured the girl. She wanted to say something, but then there was a sound of twigs snapping. The couple froze, and it seemed like they even stopped breathing. Joel, Ruth, is that you? A familiar girlish voice was heard. The relieved teenagers turned around. Emily crawled out of the bushes, all scratched up, followed by some stranger. What are you doing here? Who is this? Ruth was surprised. We need to get out of here and fast, the brunette answered angrily. Hey, calm down. What happened? Joel asked. He had never seen his friend so scared. We found two bodies, and no human could have disfigured them like that, Emily shouted, gasping for breath between tears. They're my brothers, the woman muttered again, somewhat absent-mindedly and detached. And they were eaten by a wolf, a man. Her voice filled with hatred and bitterness with each new word. Did you see them? It seemed like Joel was the only one in the whole group keeping his composure. No, but... Emily paused briefly. Only a wild, predatory beast could have done that. I don't want to think about it. It makes me sick again. These aren't wolves, the woman unexpectedly spoke up. The man turned into that creature right before my eyes. They're werewolves. What? A man? A werewolf? Emily raised her voice in surprise. I don't know what's going on here and who's doing this, but we need to get out of this forest, Joel replied firmly. Why are they taking so long? Angie couldn't bear the long silence anymore. I have no idea. I'm trying to reach them, but there's some network failure, Diego dryly replied, digging into his mobile phone. Do you think there are really wolves here? The girl asked. If there were, this area would be off limits to us, the guy confidently muttered, grinning. But Ruth saw... The redhead just couldn't calm down. She imagined it, the brunette interrupted, raising her voice. The crunch of twigs caught their attention. Finally, Marcus emerged from behind the trees. Angie froze in place from fright, while Diego rushed towards his friend. Hey, what the hell happened? The guy shouted, grabbing his friend by the armpits. There were wolves, the blonde hissed, overcoming the pain. Oh my God, the girl could only manage. Angie, the brunette called out, but there was no response. Angie, he shouted. Okay, look at me. Don't panic. Get the first aid kit from my backpack. We need to treat. The guy hesitated. He didn't know how to continue. Instead, the wounded man did it himself. This wound. The guy was already hanging on his friend's arms. Hey, Marcus. Marcus, snap out of it. The brunette said worriedly. Marcus, wait. I'll... Sobbing, Angie mumbled. Finally, she found the small box with the coveted red cross. Hey, what happened? Joel was surprised approaching the camp and still holding Ruth. Lily and Emily stopped next to them. He was attacked by wolves, Angie mumbled, crying. Diego sat nearby, looking gloomily at the ground. Marcus lay unconscious beside them. Him too? Lily was surprised. 
What do you mean, too? Who are you, even? The brunette asked angrily. This is Lily. I found her unconscious, and her brothers were also attacked, and, uh... Emily hesitated. Damn, we need to get out of here, Ruth cried out in hysteria. And how do we do that? The bus won't arrive for another couple of days. By that time, we'll all be eaten here, Diego burst out. There's an old abandoned ranger station here. I keep some things there, and I left my car nearby. If you're coming, I'll show you the way, Lily said. Carolyn set up the tent and was about to rest when her father came. He seemed agitated and was breathing heavily, apparently having run. Carolyn, there's no time to pack. We're leaving. Take only the essentials, the man suddenly said, starting to pack his backpack. Dad, what happened? Why are you breathing like that? Carolyn didn't expect her father, who had been preparing for this trip to nature for several days, to suddenly decide to turn back. There are wolves here, and very large ones at that. We still don't know what other predators have entered the tourist area. The girl on the bus was right. Now it's not safe here. Take water and food. Leave everything else. Howard said sternly. But Dad, the bus doesn't get here until, uh... There's an old ranger station nearby. Let's try to hide there for now, the man interrupted his daughter. Come on, hurry up. We don't have much time. The young people treated Marcus's wounds and, improvising stretchers from improvised materials, laid him down and set off with Lily. The woman wanted to cry all the time. She was in pain, but she understood that she had to help these kids get out of this forest. Most of all, she was angry with herself. Why did she bring that strange man to the tent? Why didn't she call her brothers right away? It was stupid. Her desire to help turned into a great tragedy. Emily pulled her out of her thoughts. I wanted to say thank you, and I know it's hard for you. It's too early to thank me. When we get out of this damn zone, then we'll talk. We're close now. Tell the guys not to lag behind, Lily said, and briskly strode ahead. In the depths of the forest. This is Charlie Three. We see a group of people heading towards the old ranger station. There are wounded among them, they radioed to the center. Priority is to find the escaped test subjects. Do you see them? Meister Wright, who was currently leading the operation, asked. No, there are no subjects nearby, Charlie Three reported and added. Should we proceed with a plan to evacuate the campers? You said there are wounded among them. Have they had contact with the subjects? Wright asked again. The wounds indicate an attack by a wild animal confirming it. They radioed back. Evacuation plan cancelled. Proceed to liquidation. Wright sentenced the tourists and disconnected. The group reached the station, and Lily immediately ran to the car. They were very tired. After all, Marcus turned out to be quite heavy. Besides, the mental stress was taking its toll. All the way, the kids felt like they were being watched by wolves and were about to be attacked. I'm so tired. Why did I agree to come here? Ruth started hysterically again. Shh! Shut up! Emily rudely interrupted her. What? You shut up! The girl would have argued, but suddenly Joel covered her mouth with his hand. Do you hear that? He whispered to Emily. The girl nodded. Someone's there, she said even quieter, pointing in the direction of the forest thicket. Lily also heard the noise and tensed up. She looked at the group of young people and motioned for them to be silent. Rustling, another rustling. Someone was approaching them. Everyone froze in fear. Had the wolves tracked them down? What should they do? run. But where to? Lily was preparing herself. She knew she didn't stand a chance against the beast that even her older brother, an experienced hunter, couldn't handle. But she felt a burning, almost uncontrollable desire to avenge Kevin and Peter. The noise grew louder, closer and closer. 
and then two figures emerged from the forest. It was a man and a young woman. Mr. Howard, Ruth suddenly exclaimed with relief. Huh? What? The man was surprised. He didn't expect to see a group of young people here. It's me, remember? The wolf tracks. We met by the stream, Lily said. I remember, but what are you all doing here? He suddenly fell silent when he saw the parked pickup truck. Is it operational? Can we use it? Yes, Lily said. I can take all of you. Someone will just have to sit in the truck bed. It doesn't matter. Let's get out of here, Howard said, and quickly headed to the vehicle. At that moment, he heard a whistling sound. Then everything went dark. The last thing he heard was his daughter's scream. Daddy, Carolyn screamed, running to her fallen father. She squatted down and tried to lift his head. But another whistling sound came from the forest, and Carolyn was hit in the leg. She screamed in pain and fell on her back. Lily immediately realized that there was a sniper in the forest and hid behind the car. Quick, hide. Someone's shooting at us, she commanded. Gunshots rang out from the forest, and the group scattered in different directions, leaving the stretcher with Marcus behind. At that moment, everyone was trying to save their own lives. Carolyn fell silent. She had lost consciousness due to pain and sudden stress. The situation was horrific and seemed hopeless. But at that moment, the sound of wolves howling and growling echoed through the area, in the depths of the forest. Get ready. We can't allow witnesses to leave the tourist area. Shoot on command, the commander of Charlie Three ordered over the radio. They positioned themselves around the perimeter, keeping their distance from each other, and watched as the young people arrived at the ranger station. Then they noticed two more people emerging from the forest on the other side. The sniper aimed the optical scope and saw the man in it. He prepared himself and waited for the order. But suddenly, a rustle behind him disturbed the sniper's peace. He didn't have time to turn around because something heavy pounced on him and sank its teeth into his back. Sharp pain ran through his body, and the sniper pulled the trigger, shooting the man. But the sniper didn't see how Carolyn's father was killed because the werewolf crushed his head with its heavy paws. Damn, who's shooting? The group commander yelled nervously into the radio. Quickly kill all the witnesses! Charlie Three began the liquidations operation, but they were not alone in the forest. And while the soldiers watched the tourists, werewolves slowly approached them. The sound of howling and beastly growls filled the air, and the battle between the escaped monsters and the elite squad of professional killers began. Gunshots, cries, and groans echoed everywhere. Immediately after the death of the sniper, the group commander died. A black she-wolf bit his head off. The male wolf chased after another victim. A young soldier, terrified, began shooting bursts from his automatic weapon, but the bullets couldn't even scratch the thick and sturdy skin of the werewolf. He was done for in a matter of seconds. The wolf released the soldier's neck, knowing where his next victim was. The beasts raged. This was their chance to avenge the years spent locked up in cages, enduring torture and experiments. After some time, the gunfire ceased, and so did the cries. The werewolves dealt with the entire Charlie Three group, and emerged from the forest towards the ranger station, where the tourists cowered in fear. Lily watched as the killer of her brothers slowly and majestically emerged from the thicket. She wanted revenge, but when she saw the huge wolf again, she was petrified and couldn't even breathe. The werewolf was covered in blood, its fur, its sharp teeth. Everything about it indicated that this beast couldn't be stopped. And furthermore, it wasn't alone. Escape from them? Even in the car, it seemed like a foolish idea. Lily suddenly realized that they couldn't do anything, and soon she would join Kevin and Peter in the afterlife. 
However, the beast suddenly stopped and stared intently at the woman. It began sniffing and caught a familiar scent emanating from the ranger. At the same time, the she-wolf wanted to pounce on Lily, but suddenly a wolf stood in her way and growled. The she-wolf was surprised by the male's behavior and bared her bloodied fangs in response. Several more seconds passed, but the beasts continued to growl and stare at each other. At one point, the she-wolf turned her gaze to Lily. A shiver ran through the woman, and unknowingly she began to step back. However, the she-wolf didn't attack. She just roared and turned, disappearing into the thicket. The male wolf followed her. He didn't even turn around or look at Lily. The woman fell to her knees and cried. She would live, but she would never be able to avenge the death of her loved ones. The beasts left the station, leaving behind the dead soldiers and terrified tourists. Central Base Director, the results have exceeded all our expectations. Even heavy weapons can't penetrate their skin, one of the scientists who was over 50 said excitedly. We must capture them and study them. But where do we find them? They've left the forest, and their whereabouts are unknown, another woman in a strict suit interjected. Her stern look indicated her dissatisfaction with the current situation. That's not a problem. We'll find them through the bodies, Director Liana said. They'll get hungry, or their animal instincts will awaken. One way or another, they'll leave a trail, and we'll catch them. The Council would like to minimize civilian casualties, the woman in the suit spoke again. Your carelessness has cost us dearly. All of this mess is your fault, Director. I don't deny my responsibility, and I'm ready to answer to the Council, Liana interrupted the woman. But don't forget, results are paramount, and our successes in this regard are undeniable. Stop arguing, the old scientist spoke again. This injection 14, 08 is simply miraculous. We need to repeat the experiment. Have you prepared the test subjects, director? He asked impatiently and with a manic excitement. Yes, those are the same girls and boys from the tourist group. We've already injected the oldest among them, the woman who had contact with object 237, and she's under observation, Liana replied. Wonderful. I would like to see her first, the scientist said, and they headed together to laboratory, 